there are issues that sometimes border on stupid and stupider. They go from dumb to dumber to dumbest. And then you think, how dumb can it get? And it gets worse. Jesus kind of dealt with that a lot when people were often trying to trap him in some way by some statement that he might make or some written law that might have been existing in the Torah or in the law and the prophets. And so, though they didn't have the answer, Jesus knew what was in the heart of men so he could always answer according to what the direction of what God intended for the law to be as well as the issue that was at hand to what the people were arguing about. I get frustrated. Now, I always have an answer. I don't have a problem with having where the answer is and what the answer is. It's always in the Word of God. God will always give you wisdom if you ever lack it. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who braideth out but giveth to all men liberally. We're told that. It's a promise from God. It's in James 1.5. It's very simple. I only hang on to the simple things because I'm not the wisest kid on the block, but I am the smartest kid in the sense that I know where to go to get my answers. God. God is the one who wrote it, so God is the one who knows it, and God is the one who can reveal it. And since God said you can't understand it unless I reveal it, I don't expect people to agree with me. I fully expect them not to know. So I tell them, go where you'll get your answer. Because the Holy Spirit makes applicable, meaning that he applies the answer that fits for you. Now, I don't know what your answer you may need. You know, you may, you may have a whole issue you know, going along that God wants to deal with and you're busy arguing about some other topic. Well, God may not answer you according to the topic you want answered, but he will deal with the issue he wants to resolve. And that's where people get off on tangents in theology. They try to create universal answers and systematic theology has a universalism to it that in and of itself doesn't answer some of the questions that it purports to have the answer for. I don't know why people don't recognize that, but they don't. And so they apply oftentimes that same perspective of universalism that they are critical of to a type of theological predicate that they think that they can answer the questions thereof. And the answer has always been that simple. Go to God. Go to the horse's mouth. Get it from God and you'll get the right answer. Because God knows where you're at, what you are, and how you need to hear what kind of answer you need to hear. It isn't that he changes the answer, but he deals with the issue at hand so you'll be able to better understand the answer once he does reveal the complete truth. And the full truth is always contained in the scriptures. It's from Genesis to Revelation. We have all that we ever needed and all that we ever would desire to know about God or about anything that has life because all the issuance of, of life are in the book of life. And that's what the scriptures are called. And so the word of God itself is always the answer. As God said, ask me and I'll answer. Seek me and I'll be found. Knock and the door will be open. So one of the issues that I hear the most ridiculous statements you know, made by Christians and then the most ridiculous arguments promoted to those Christians to see if they'll trip up or fall down or whether they'll be able to answer as God would give them the wisdom to answer is about homosexuality. It's like they argue and debate this stupid idea that somehow, you know, homosexuals of course can be saved or of course can't be. You know, they'll take a reverse polarity on both issues, sides of the topic, trying to discuss whether or not the issue at hand, salvation, is as important as the nature of the person, the homosexual question. The homosexual question is simple. It's a person who is choosing to exercise their rights and privileges according to their own understanding of what they want to do with another person. If those two people consent to do that, then they are doing what is called in the normal eyes of the Bible, perversion. It's that simple, very clear. God said, this is the way that you were designed to be. You were meant to have, pardon me, but you were meant to have an anus, to put it bluntly, for defecation. That's what it's there for. You have a mouth to speak, you have ears to hear, you have eyes to see, and you have members that procreate for procreation. That's the design. Anytime that you change the design of any member and use it for any other purpose, then you are deviating or you are doing deviant behavior. And that can mean things as simple as 
you know some of the silly things that people do in their sexual revolutionary ideas you know they think oh well we're going to have some type of sex that god never intended it to have and the reality is that's deviant behavior according to the scriptures you can go to song of solomon and try to create something there that you want to see but the truth is let's go back to what god said and meant to be because jesus puts it pretty clear pretty specific he is saying what he means, and he means what he says, and that's what the Bible does. It says what it means, it means what it says. There's no uncertainty as far as the terms are concerned. So when we get to the issue of the gospel, the gospel is about salvation. That's it, pure and simple. That's what salvation is. It is the recognizing of a relationship that has been severed, and God wants to restore, that God wants to bring about the salvation of a person from hell, where they're headed, so that they can go to heaven and have relationship with God. Now, a person may have an agenda of their own. I know there's a lot of Christians that want to have, you know, their own little kingdom. They want to set up their own little, you know, territories and they want to have, you know, their Harley in heaven or they want to take a computer to, you know, God or they want to somehow have technology, you know, in the spiritual realm. No matter what your favorite idea is about heaven, it's a spiritual reality. Nothing of that is created in the physical dimension is going to go into the spiritual dimension. Everyone that goes into the spiritual dimension will be perfect or they will be cast out of that spiritual dimension into outer darkness where there is gnashing of teeth and that gnashing of teeth is in the lake of fire. That's the bottom line. Everything that is deviant, everything that is not, or everything that is corruptible, Everything that is incorruptible to heaven, anything that's corruptible will be outside of heaven. And that's the point of what it is. When salvation is accomplished in you and I, when it is finally worked out in us through death, through the death of the body, the flesh, then that salvation that we have is the changing of the incorruptible, or of the corruptible into incorruptible, from the deviant into the accurate. And that's when we will be what God intended us to be. Before then, no, we still exist in a corruption. We will have incorruption. And so people have corrupted minds and they think in corrupted ways. Oftentimes they can't differentiate between that which is of the earth and that which is of the heavens. And sometimes they can't even tell what's godly and what's not godly. And that's what happens when you get into salvation issues when you talk about the homosexual gospel. Of course a homosexual person can be saved. And of course a homosexual person should stop that lifestyle. The same way that any fornicator should stop fornicating. Because no, there are fornicators that will go to heaven, but that doesn't mean that if you continue on in fornication that you're going to go to heaven. To put it bluntly, there may be an issue that is not part of salvation that you may be caught up in that you're dealing with as far as your your development as a mature person in God and God wanting to have a relationship with you he wants to change you into the image of his son you may have issues with that that you're dealing with and so at a temporary point of time you may be going through certain things that you are a fornicator but in the end no fornicators are in heaven you're changed you're taken away from that issuance if you are caught in the captivity and bondage thereof but if you're using that question of salvation, of whether a fornicator could be in heaven, then you're not really dealing with the salvation issue, are you? You're not dealing with whether or not you're saved, because salvation is determined by God alone. And God will tell you, you're not saved if the issue is whether or not to be fornicating or not, when he says, don't fornicate. That's the same thing that's true about homosexuality. When God says, you know, they changed the image of the corruptible God into the image of corruptible man and then they were given over by God to their own lusts. If God gives something over to being used, that means he's given up on something. You need to, you know, sit down and have a serious talk with God. Because if you think that you're an exercising, practicing, you know, die in the wool, hardcore, you know, homosexual, and that you can automatically say, you know, God, I want to be in heaven and I want to be there as a homosexual, I question what you want. Because you don't want salvation. You don't want a relationship with God. You want your God, your way, with your own agenda. And that's the difference between what the question is and the answer. You see, the answer to every question about salvation is that anyone and everyone, all God has died for the sins of the world. Jesus was in heaven 
and heard the Father say, Who can we send to save the world? And Jesus says, Hey, send me. So God did. And he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we know that. Should not. Doesn't mean they won't. Just because Jesus died on the cross doesn't mean you automatically get salvation. Just because Jesus took care of the sins of the world doesn't mean you automatically are forgiven. Just because Jesus has become the propitiation for sin of the actions that man has committed, both past, present, and future, doesn't mean you can't find yourself in rebellion to God and still wind up in hell. You see, there has to be something more than just, oh, well, now that it's done, it's automated and automatic and it's mechanization of the salvation process. No. You see, grace is extended to you in the sense that God is the one who extends it to you. By his mercy and by his grace we are saved. Not because only that Jesus died, but because God extends his mercy towards us in that while we are yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Opening the door for the opportunity of salvation to be accomplished in us. We look at the time frame and we say, oh, well, you know, of course, you know, we, we you know, we, we're, we're not perfect and that, you know, we will be made perfect when we get to heaven. So we think of it as a process of salvation on the earth. And in reality, that's true. But as far as God's determination, before there was a foundation of the world, or before even the books were written, God already knew who would and who wouldn't choose him. Who would be rebellious towards him, how it would all work out in the end. God knew the beginning from the end. And so he determined already, you're saved or you're not. It didn't have to do with whether you were a homosexual, whether you were a fornicator, whether you are an adulterer, whether you are a murderer, whether you are a child molester, whatever you were or are today. Because you see, God already knows in the end, will you continue on in that sin or will you be forgiven of it? And that's the reality of where you are today. Because we're told today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as it says in the provocation. That means that today, of course, you can be saved and you can be working in the process of salvation as we're told to work out your salvation with fear and trembling knowing full well that we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do lots of people think and today would say to you you know and to me and to myself and to the friends around me oh I'm saved of course I am well you know fear and trembling is a good reason to have that because should God decide at any point in time you're not you have no options that's the bottom line that's why it says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because the realization of the accomplished work of Jesus Christ is through the process in our life of salvation even though it's already accomplished. See, on the one hand, as far as God's concerned, it's done. But what you did or didn't do, we're waiting to see because salvation will produce in and of itself a relationship with God. There is that process where we have something that changes our perspective, that causes us to realize there is a God. Now we need to deal with God on a personal basis. And from that moment on, that's the process of salvation. We call it sanctification, a fancy theological term to try to understand how God could already say we're saved, and yet we're still working it out in our own mind, as well as our heart, to find ourselves in that salvation that Jesus has purchased for us, that Jesus intercedes on our behalf for, that we would not be deceived by the world and to turn our backs on God and to walk away from him permanently. Because you see, Pharaoh himself was being dealt with at one point in time. Pharaoh had salvation presented to him right in front of his face. He could have dealt with God face to face in the reality of Moses. And he chose to play games with God. And so he postponed the time until finally God said, I've had enough. And then God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So, likewise, in life today, people like to say so that they are not so adamant about it that, oh, well, you know, what about homosexuals? Can they be saved? Well, of course they can. Just like any other sinner. Anybody can be saved. Will they? Some will, some won't, just like any other fornicator, just like any adulterer, just like any Christian. Because nobody knows who factually, actually, and in the reality of eternity is there until they're there. It's kind of like Chuck Smith used to say on one side of the door is written chosen, on the other side of the door is free will. 
You know, people like to say, well, I've got free will, I can do whatever I want to. Well, you can, but it's already been determined what your free will is going to determine for you because you've already exercised your choice of free will, whether you know it or not, in time, because God already saw through time that you would choose your free will in order to not choose him, so he already determined that you wouldn't be saved because he already knew that you weren't going to choose him in the first place. Because he's bigger than you are, smarter than you are, and he already has an understanding, and that's why he already used you anyway as a vessel of dishonor as opposed to a vessel of honor. And that's the reality of why we have a God in charge of salvation and not man in charge of salvation. Because you see, if it's a religious work, then we wouldn't need Jesus to die in the first place. We could all work it out just like the Jews did. The Jews had come up to the reality of the statement that Paul said as far as pertaining to the law, I am perfect. Guiltless. Perfect, according to the law. According to everything that the law mandated, that God gave and Moses gave, Paul, so, stated straight up in a legal court, the court of public opinion and the court of our own, you know, we could say, uh, religious court, halakhic way, that was he perfect? Oh yeah! And that's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a point when they were confronting Jesus, to a degree, but he challenged them in their perspective of their righteousness. Because they may have said they were perfect as far as the outward things, but Jesus said, look at the inward. Where are you at on that? Whoa, wait a minute now. We got it down where the outward. You mean we got to work on the inner now? And ever since then, none are righteous. No, not one, except Jesus. Because the inward is what comes out and is manifested to us with the outward actions. And the outward actions belied what was going on on the inward man when it came to those that were supposedly perfect in God's eyes regarding to the law and the prophets. So, in our modern day with evangelical Christians and with theology and people trying to argue and debate and you know question whether or not God is fair or just or merciful or all those things, they're messing around with the wrong question. They're not asking the simplicity, what must I do to be saved? Because the same thing is true today as it was ever before since the time that Jesus hung on the cross and the priest, the priest, the thief next to him said, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, while they were in paradise, I'm sure Jesus added a little more to it, you know. They probably had a long discussion while they were in Sheol, the grave, you know, discussing what was, you know, needed to be done, you know. Basically, the guy wound up saved. But, irregardless or regardless, the point is, you call upon the name of the Lord. If you're calling, I mean, really calling, and you know whether you're calling on the name of the Lord. If you're calling on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Not just if you call him the name of the Lord or say, oh, in Jesus' name. That's not calling on the name of the Lord. Crying out for salvation is calling. That's calling. You notice the difference? Someone that calls you expects a response. They want to hear from you. You know, if I call you, I want you to respond. And if you don't respond, then I can't just claim I heard you. Oh, I could say I did. I could act like I did. I could run around and tell everyone I did. But only you and I know whether you responded to me calling you or not. And the same thing is true with God. I don't know anybody that's saved. I only know that I have talked to God and God has talked to me. And I tr trust in that relationship that I have with him. Because I can't trust in man. Man will tell me why I can be assured of salvation. And the funny thing is, the one assurance that he gives me is very simple. He who has the Son has life, but he who has not the Son of God has not life. So it is still about my relationship with God, my relationship with Jesus, my relationship in establishment of that fact that yes, God died for me. Yes, God took care of all the problems and sins that are in my life. Yes, God took care of every sin I'll ever commit. But do I have the Son and does the Son have me? And that's why the question of a gospel to the homosexual is no different than anybody else's issues in life. Oh, they may face more struggles. They may have more twisted ideas because, quite frankly, the Book of Romans tells us that they did know God. A person who has a homosexual issue knew God at some point in time. The Book of Romans is clear on that. It's very obvious. The same way that most people in a Christian nation like America know about God. They know about Christians. They have a certain amount of knowledge. They may not know personally any application of having dealt with God in a real way. They may say, oh well, you know, I went to church. Well, that's not dealing with God. That's dealing with the church. 
They may say, well, you know, I read the Bible. Well, I'm glad you dealt with the Bible, but you didn't deal with God, did you? Have you ever talked to God and did God talk to you? And that's the point of what Romans is trying to say. Look, these people have dealt with some issue with God and rejected what God said. And that's why the issue is never the question that's being asked, but it's always something of the heart. There's something blocking a person that challenges them whether they will make the change and repent or turn from what they're doing to what they want or will they just say they want it and keep doing what they're doing. And that's the problem with our salvation message sometimes. When a person really wants to be saved, they don't care. I mean, I may want to go swimming and I may want to swim to Catalina Island, you know, and I may start swimming and I might make it halfway, three quarters of the way there or just right where the turf is, but if I don't make it all the way, I drown. And I may still want to keep going and die drowned because I didn't know how to swim. In other words, I may want it, I may think I could do it, I may maybe even make some pretty good progress at it, but unless I make it all the way, I didn't have it in the first place. I did not get saved from my effort to make it to Catalina Island. So getting to Catalina Island is the issue of whether you're saved or not. When you're there, you're saved. When you weren't, you're not. That simple. Sorry. Now, people want to have an assurance, and it's pretty easy to have that assurance. We're told that over and over again. If you got the sun, you got it. If you don't, you don't. Simple. Do you have him, or do you just have your understanding of him? And that's why we say you have to have the relationship and the religion. It's not one or the other. It's the reality of the religion it helps you to understand your relationship a little better and it helps to get you into a closer, more intimate relationship than you have. And that's why this stupid idea about can a homosexual be saved? Of course he can. If he gets saved and he's still got issues, he's dealing with them. If you're not dealing with them, you're probably in trouble. You know, me personally, if I was getting ready to swim to Catalina Island, I would take swimming lessons. I'm serious. I would take swimming lessons. If I knew that I had to swim to Catalina Island, in order to be saved, I would take swimming lessons. And you know what? I would work on swimming as much as I could, all the time that I could, any chance that I could. And I could take a lot of trips with a life preserver right next to me. And you know what? I may swim halfway and grab that life preserver. I may swim three quarters away and grab that life preserver. I may swim almost all the way and grab that life, life, life preserver. But until the very last trip, when I finally make it all the way, I'm keeping that life preserver with me. And you know what? That's what life is when it comes to salvation issues. Don't give me your theology. Give me your grace. Don't give me your theological idioms that you think are dogmas or doctrines, but give me mercy and loving kindness. Give me the reality of what God has said to me personally. And I'll tell you that God will save to the uttermost, and he will do everything within his capabilities to influence the person to come to the salvation that God has provided for them. But if they choose to go to hell, it's because they chose to. A person who chooses a lifestyle to stay that way and wants to stay that way and refuses to change in any way, of course they're not saved. Any more than a person who exercises the things thereof that they want to make it, keeps trying but fails, always comes back to being forgiven because of the grace and mercy that's being extended to them. They cling to that. They cry out for that. They call upon God to be saved. And that's what you do every time you go and ask for forgiveness. It's not about asking forgiveness as though you're not going to be forgiven. It's asking for forgiveness because you're crying out to God to save you from yourself. Not save you from damnation or hellfire because you know that God saved you, but to save you from the effort that you keep trying and failing in. You want to be better because you love the person that you're going towards, that's standing on the beach in Catalina Island waiting for you to make it all the way, who's going to embrace you and say, you did it, you won, you were the champion. We are the champion. No, but really, I mean, forget the champion part, but you made it, you swam, you know, and just about the time that you get close to that shore, you're gonna hear a voice call out and say, walk on the water. And you go, wait a minute, you mean I've been swimming and I could have been walking? You mean I could have walked on water all the way to Catalina Island? And Jesus says, yeah, you could have. Did you? No. Should you have? Well, you know, you could have. 
And that's the point of grace and faith of where you're at today. I don't know about you, but me? Hey, I'm walking on water, man. I'm I'm cruising and snoozing, you know, and I'm not losing anything. I'm enjoying it. You know, I'm I'm like walking on the nature of the waves themselves and I'm looking around and seeing all the people struggling and they're swimming. You know, and I see these guys, you know, with their heads bopping up and down in the water, you know, I'm going, Hey, breaststroke, backstroke, you know, side stroke, you know, hey, life preserver, you know, and I'm walking on the water telling, Hey, here here's a here's a little Here's a life preserver. It's called grace. Hey, here's a life preserver. It's called forgiveness. Hey, here's a life preserver. It's called mercy. And I'm walking by them because they're still struggling while they're swimming to Catalina Island. I'm just walking there. And that's what the reality of God wants for you in your relationship with Him. Of course He wants you to know you're saved. Of course He wants you to know that you're forgiven. Whether you're a homosexual, child molester, a murderer, an axe adulterer, whatever, any of the number of sins that you know plague mankind from the beginning of creation all the way into this day until the day of damnation when all sin is cast into the lake of fire. Anyone can be saved. All people should be saved. Any person, including homosexuals, should be saved and could be saved and would be saved if they choose to be saved. And that's the reality of life. Are they choosing Jesus Christ? Are they choosing to be God's children? Are they choosing to walk and talk with God and deal with Him about their sins, whatever they may be, whether homosexual, murder, you know, any of it, all of it, or are they choosing to hang on to something that's really the issue and they don't want salvation after all? Because they're willing to say, like Jesus said, hey, don't tell me you got to bury your dead. Let the dead bury the dead. And he said, follow me. Don't tell me you love your mother, your brother, your sister, your family, or your friends more than me. You follow me. Don't tell me what you were going to not give up in order to follow me. But Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And you'll be saved. Because where I am, there you will be. And I will give you more than what you think you have in your carnal desires and your fleshly will. I will give you the comforter even the Holy Spirit who will fill you to such a satisfaction that not only will you be swimming on your way to Catalina Island but you'll learn how to walk on water <laughs>